My name is Vladimir Bulovic. I'm the director of MIT Nano, and I have the pleasure of hosting uh, a number of these incredible seminars offered to us by students and postdocs of MIT. Uh, we are extremely fortunate to have this morning Samantha McBride. Uh, she is a former member of Kripa Varanasi's and Henry Louis Girard's groups. Um, and uh, has graduated from MIT with a PhD in December, uh, immediately decided to step into action and help us teach classes this semester as a lecturer. Uh, and this is uh, prior to her soon to depart from MIT for her postdoc position at Princeton that's coming up later uh, this year. Um, Samantha has an incredible talk. Uh, Varanasi and Henry Luis Carras groups are well known for having incredible students. So I am uh, going to stop talking and let Samantha take over uh, and give us a lecture. If you have questions for Samantha, uh, please don't interrupt during the talk. Zoom is a difficult medium to uh, respond on moment's notice. So we'll wait towards the end of her talk, at which point you can raise your hand or write a chat message. Uh, and I will make sure I relate your questions or call upon you, uh, moderating hence the interactions. The other thing that is very valuable for the rest of us on the phone call with slower internet connections is that if you uh, turn off your video and mute your sound uh, as you're listening to Samantha, that would be uh, speeding up the rest of our video connections. So thank you so much. And Samantha, please do take over. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm very excited to share with all of you some of the projects I worked on as a PhD student working with Professor Kripa Varanasi. Um, and these two projects both have to do with evaporation of saline drops and some of the interesting nanoscale phenomena that arise during this evaporation. And so evaporation of saline drops is kind of a variation of something called evaporative deposition. Usually this involves the deposition of a drop containing particles onto a substrate and allowing it to evaporate. And then based on the energetic interactions between the substrate, the solvent, and the particles inside of this drop, different patterns and different deposits can emerge. The most common of these is when the particles all accumulate around the outer edge of this drop to form something called a coffee ring, which is just a single ring-like shape um, of the evaporative deposit. And so this traditionally has most application for inkjet printing, in which we really want to have a nice localized condensed deposit where all the particles have settled uniformly, rather than having this coffee rate effect, because this first case on the left is going to give us a higher resolution for this printer. It's also been finding new applications in sensors and diagnostics, where if you have a certain chemistry or a certain particle shape inside of your drop, once you look at the deposit that's left behind after ev evaporation, you might see a difference between the morphologies of that deposit with and without whatever compound you're looking for, making it a very sensitive and interesting tool for doing different types of sensors. And then a final application that's emerging is in the field of microscale patterning and self-assembly, where deposition of colloids on this blank scale have a variety of applications uh, for different types of patterns. And so in my experiment, I'm replacing this kind of particle Latin drop with a saline drop containing dissolved salts. So just as in the coffee ring effect where we have these particles accumulating at this outer edge of your deposit, you also have this formation of crystals at the outer edge of the deposit due to the, both the evaporative flow and to concentration polarization on the outside of your droplets. So leaving you with this ring shape made up of these individual crystals. And so in these experiments, uh, they're very simple to do. I just take a drop of my saline solution, I deposit it on a substrate, and then I record what's happening as it evaporates and forms these crystals on the outer edge. So in today's talk, I'm going to talk about two nanoscale phenomena that occur during this evaporation the deceptively simple experiments actually give way to some very interesting phenomena. The first I'm going to talk about is crystal patterning via fluid instabilities at the mobile contact line, where we see this regular emergence of these really cool patterns during evaporation of a drop. And the second one is going to be talking about how evaporative flows 
coupled with nano scale confinement on a super hydrophobic surface lead to this very interesting effect in which crystals lift off and inject from the surface. So first let's start with the patterning work. So throughout my PhD, I've been looking at these evaporating drops containing crystals and how different substrates interact with patterns. And so I've primarily been looking at the hydrophobicity of a drop, which is usually characterized by the contact angle. So in my work, I've been looking a lot at dynamic contact angles, which is the advancing contact angle and a receding contact angle, where the advancing angle is the angle that a drop will adapt while it's moving uh, forward, and the receding angle is the angle that a drop will adapt um, during receding motion. And so I won't discuss all of the patterns that I observed during my PhD here, uh, but it turns out that you can form a phase diagram just looking at these contact angles. So on this axis here, I have the advancing angle, and up here I have the ratio between these two angles, which is a measure of the contact angle hysteresis. And so for most substrates, you end up forming just a simple crystalline coffee ring where you have the ring shape and then there's kind of nothing going on. But at the extremes, you get some really interesting patterns. And so today I'm going to be focusing on this lower left corner where we have triangular and these periodic array patterns forming. So in this experiment, I deposited a drop of calcium sulfate solution on a very, very hydrophilic surface. So one where water wants to spread over it and allow it to evaporate. So at first, evaporation proceeds pretty much as you would expect. The drop spreads out and then these coffee ring crystals can start to form around the outer edge until finally the entire thing evaporates and the contact line recedes. So just looking at this, it doesn't really look particularly interesting, but when you zoom in on the inside of this deposit here, and you turn the contrast way up, what you see are these triangular patterns that regularly emerge. If we then increase the contact angle a little bit, and I'm gonna show a video here, hopefully the latency isn't too bad, we get some changes in the patterning behavior. So if we watch this area, the drop evaporates, it ruptures, and if you track that contact line motion, you can see this really cool formation of these periodic arrays, uh, crystalline patterns that are left behind. And so if we then look at the SEM images of what we're actually looking at, you can see that these are actually very ordered. They almost have this hexagonal symmetry in these periodic crystal clusters. And in this lower image, you can see that this periodicity eventually gives way to kind of a branch structure, and then finally back into a triangular structure. So the next question to ask is, what exactly are we looking at here? And so again, looking at SEM images and AFM images, what we can see is that these are actually kind of crystal clusters that form on the substrates uh, during evaporation. The triangles are a little bit more difficult to understand. And what they are is a dendritic blanket of crystals, where dendritic structures tend to form in diffusion limited cases, um, except we have kind of multiple layers of this blanket. So we have a lighter phase, which is actually a thinner phase of that crystal, and then a darker phase, which is a thicker phase. So we can see that more apparently if we look at AF images or if we look at this tilted SEM image where the difference between those two layers is a lot more apparent. And so this difference in height gives us the optical effect that makes it look like we have kind of two different colors of those uh, triangular patterns. And so I decided to split these different patterns up into three different regimes. The first one I'm calling the periodic arrays, where again, you can kind of see this hexagonal symmetry. The second I'm calling the branching regime, where you still have these periodic crystal clusters, except now rather than being on a micro scale length, they're more of a nano scale length, and they have this 
arrangement into these lines. And then finally, the dendritic triangle structures, uh, which I'm just calling the triangular gene. And so it turns out that we can predict what type of pattern we're going to get when we evaporate a drop just based on the substrate contact angle and on the temperature at which we evaporate. And so in this plot here, I have blue circles to indicate this uh, periodic array regime. The yellow triangles indicate the yellow or the triangular regime. And then the squares indicate this intermediate regime that I'm calling branching. And then at the limits of this phase diagram, we have two non-patterning extremes. So this is important because it means that we can predict which pattern is going to arise just based on the evaporation rate and the contact angle, which hopefully will tell us something about the physics of what's happening here. So to further investigate this, I wanted to do some high-speed videos. So again, hopefully the latency on this will allow you to see what's happening. In this first video, we can see that contact line moving. And as the larger drop moves, you can see that these smaller drops are pinching off from that uh, interface and then they fully evaporate to leave behind those periodic arrays, which I think is pretty cool. It's almost like this larger drop is printing the smaller drop to leave behind these patterns. In the second video, I'm going to show the formation of the triangular patterns, which is a little bit harder to see. But if you look carefully, particularly up here, what you can see is that when we start to get this second phase, of those dendritic patterns, there's actually very slight variation at that contact line, which indicates a change in the thickness of the fluid height at that point. So you can see here there's kind of like this black in this one phase, and over here it's just light, uh, which is difficult to see, I know, probably especially um, over Zoom. And so this is important because it tells us that it's a change in the fluid height that is leading to the formation of those triangular patterns. So let's kind of break this down. First, we have that array formation, which is pretty clear from the videos that we're seeing some type of a fingering instability leading to pinch off of the drops. And so in this snapshot taken from a high-speed video, you can see this kind of regular pinch off. And then as the contact line further recedes, it's depositing actually miniature drops. So they're not crystals at that point. It's really once those crystals, or once the water completely evaporates, that we're left with that crystal structure um, as a result. The problem in deciphering this is that there are a lot of different mechanisms that can result in fingering instabilities. So one such mechanism is a Marangoni instability where salt acts as something of an anti-surfactant, where accumulation of a higher salt concentration will actually increase surface tension. So we might imagine this effect where we start to accumulate salt at a very microscopic point of that contact line, and that kind of propagates an instability where we have flow from the areas of low surface tension to the areas of higher surface tension, because those areas are kind of pulling on the fluid a little bit harder. So this mechanism would lead to a, I'm not sure if this is weird on your screen too, but this would lead to a pinch off of the drops at a characteristic Marangoni wavelength. Um, and based on the velocity of that contact line, you could also define a parameter beta, the distance between those in the radial direction, and then also the diff distance between the deposits in the axial direction, which would be some wavelength characteristic of the instability. So other possible mechanisms include a crystallization depletion mechanism, which would be related to the diffusion rates versus the reaction rates of that crystal formation that leads to kind of a periodic nucleation that then pins the contact line. Now in the high speed videos, we don't really see that the contact line is being pinned in place we see more of a drop pinch off, which maybe suggests that the instability is more related to the fluid physics than it is to the reaction physics. Another possible instability is the Rayleigh plateau, which just describes the pinch off of drops at a liquid rim. 
um, which then leads to a very predictable wavelength that is known based on the height of that thin film. And so, of course, the problem in deciphering between all these mechanisms is that the Rayleigh plateau instability and the Marangoni instability actually have the same dependence on the wavelength as linear with the height of the thin film. And indeed, when we plot the wavelength between those periodic arrays against the height of the thin film, where we have a nanoscale film, um, you do indeed see that it is a linear relationship, which is great because it means it's likely one of these two instabilities occurring, uh, but it's more difficult to decipher which. So next, let's talk about the triangle formation, which is a little bit more mysterious, I think, than the fingering instability, since fingering instabilities are observed um, in many places. And so now if we take the snapshots from some of the high-speed videos and take the time to really look at them, it becomes more apparent what I tried to point out earlier with that video, where there's some variation in this contact line as it's moving across these two phases. It's particularly apparent in this last image where you can see this black little bit of fluid here is much uh, further out than the contact line is for this darker phase that's emerging. So that, that means that the fluid line is actually receding faster over these thicker areas, the thicker phase that's emerging. It's also possibly more apparent in this image where again, you have this kind of contact line recession at the phase that's emerging, and then the contact line is a little bit more advanced or I guess slower on the previous phase, um, which you can see here. And so if we kind of break this down into a cartoon, what we see is that there are these periodic nucleation points, which are the kind of top of those triangles as they start forming. As the contact line recedes and moves downwards, the triangles continue to form and we almost have this flow moving towards uh, these triangular regions where the contact line here at the emerging phase is moving just a little bit faster than it is in the surrounding phase. And so based on both the contact line velocity in the radial direction and then some instability velocity in the axial direction, uh, we get a variety of patterns um, where if, I'm not sure if this is weird on your screen too, or if it's just mine, but what you should see here is a definition of a wavelength between these two triangular peaks, and then a definition of the triangular angle, which is going to be a function of this contact line velocity and of the axial velocity. And so one possibility of what's going on here could be that it's a thin film instability during viscous de-wetting. And so this thin film instability is related to nanoscale forces, uh, van der Waals forces, and usually this instability is only observed through polymer films because polymer films can get really, really thin as opposed to water films, which typically don't get quite as small. However, in this case, the water film becomes much smaller than it normally would due to contact line pinning due to that outer ring of crystals that we first saw. And so it's possible that here, the thin film becomes thin enough that you have a nucleation of this thin film instability, which would then grow a little bit faster than the surrounding phases and have a different fluid height than the previous phase. And as that instability grows, rather than spreading outward, it is dragged along the contact line to form a triangular shape. And so this instability has a h squared dependence, where h is the height of the thin film. And so if we plot this using actual parameters, um, where a captures some of the energetic interactions between water and the silicon substrate I'm using, you actually get very good agreement with this model and the experimental data. So finally, there's the branch regime, which I believe is kind of a mixture between these two regimes, as it has features of both. And you can kind of see what I was talking about earlier more readily using the branching regime because the contact line is a little bit thicker and thus the instability is also a little bit larger um, where it's almost like this circle that's expanding except when you pull a circle in one direction, it forms a triangle. <laughs> 
And so I think this is pretty cool because these patterns are observed throughout nature. You see these periodic uh, different arrays in reaction diffusion patterns. You see triangular patterns in geology. Um, and one pattern that I didn't discuss, but you can ask me about later, spiral patterns are also observed. Um, it's cool that we can form these using just a simple evaporating drop. In addition to being cool, this is also functional because what we have now is a water soluble mask that's patterned on a micro or nano length scale. And so I took one of these patterns, the periodic array pattern, and I put it in a reactive ion etch, which then created this three dimensional structure, and then put this into salt water, which then dissolved those crystals. And you're left with this periodic three dimensional micro scale textured surface, which you can normally only form using kind of a complicated series of steps involving adding a mask, removing the mask, um, and now you have a very easy water-soluble way of doing that. You could also do this with sputtering to create a two-dimensional uh, patterns chemistry rather than making this three-dimensional patterns uh, substrate. So that's all I wanted to say on crystal patterning. Uh, next, I'm going to move on to this kind of evaporative flow crystal ejection phenomena, which I'm calling the crystal crater effect. So now in these experiments, rather than seeing the extreme hydrophilic, which is what I just talked about, now we're going to the other extreme, which is a super hydrophobic surface. And we're also changing the salt from so uh, calcium sulfate to sodium chloride. So in these experiments, we have the salt water placed on this super hydrophobic surface with nanoscale chemist or nanoscale texture, and we're evaporating it. So when we first place it, you can see it's super hydrophobic due to the, how the drop is sitting on it. And crystals start to form at that air water interface, which is what we would expect due to that concentration polarization. The crystals kind of form this globe shape where they're surrounding the whole drop of water. And then towards the end of evaporation, when the water is almost all gone, you get this very weird effect. So what you're seeing is these little legs forming, and it's actually kind of pushing the whole thing up and off of the substrate. So I'm calling this the crystal critter effect because it looks a little bit like a critter, and it almost looks alive with the way that it moves. And if you want to see more, of these videos, uh, you can Google this APS gallery of fluid motion from 2019. Just Google the crystal clear effect. And so this is clearly kind of a very unusual phenomenon, which raises the question, why hasn't this been observed previously? And indeed, there's actually an article in Langmuir published a couple years ago that is looking at the formation of salt structures on super hydrophobic surfaces. And they're using the same chemistry, same temperatures that I'm using. Uh, so why aren't they seeing what I'm seeing? And the answer to that is, well, it would be this image uh, where the texture that they're using for their super hydrophobic surface has a microscopic or yeah, micro scale texture rather than a nanoscale. And so in my work, I am looking at a actual nano textured silica where we have these periodic peaks and valleys um, with a very small length scale. So let's just watch what's happening one more time. This is a close up of those legs. And if you pick a point to look at, maybe this one, you can actually see that the whole thing is going up, up, and like lifting off where this here is a substrate, you can kind of see it based on the reflection. And so what this tells us is that whatever is happening, it's happening right at the surface on very, very small length scale that we can't see. And as evaporation comes to a close, you can see this tapering off of those legs. And then eventually it's almost like the entire structure is just completely rejected from the surface. It's only contacting the surface in just a few little points. So to understand what is happening with those legs, uh, we took an image from looking down on the surface uh, from above. And so in this image, we're looking down at the drop, 
we focus the microscope on the surface. And so this is prior to evaporation has begun, so you don't have crystals clogging everything. But you can see these little dimples where the liquid has intruded into this nanoscale chemistry. And so then if we take a closer view of some of the legs, you can see a few things. First, in this tube here, there's actually a bubble. And there's a video I have that shows that bubble moving through the tube. Next, I also took an SEM image of a case where one of these tubes has been left behind on the surface. And you can see that the whole thing is actually hollow. And even using SEM analysis, going zooming and really zooming in on one of these tubes, it's still very hard to see what exactly is happening here in between the tube and the surface. Again, suggesting that whatever is happening, it's happening on a very, very small length scale. Then the final piece of evidence is that if we look at the stains that are left behind on the surface, uh, what you can see is that there's actually a little tiny bit of salt that's left inside of this nanoscale texture here. And that's important because we know that this is likely where those tubes were forming and combining kind of this observation of these salt stains with the observation of these dimples on the uh, drop before evaporation suggests that wherever the liquid is intruding into this nanoscale texture is also the same place that's forming these salt stains is the same place where the legs are going to be growing. So now we want to know why do the critters only grow on the nanotexture? So in this first image, I have the critter case where we have this nanoscale texture we have a contact angle of about 155 degrees, so it's super hydrophobic. The formation of that globe, and then finally the left, formation of the legs and the liftoff. So what happens if we use a microtexture instead of a nanotexture like that previous paper had done? So you get a pretty similar contact angle of 150 degrees on this periodic micropillar structure rather than a nanotexture. Except as you evaporate, you get this kind of pancaking of the drop as it intrudes into the texture and kind of forms this very flat donut shape. So now we want to know porous texture. And this image here that maybe you're seeing um, is the opposite of this micro pillar texture, where instead of having pillars sticking up off the surface, you have holes sticking into the surface. Um, so maybe that's important. But again, this microscale porous texture, you get this flattening out of the salt structure. And finally, we want to know what happens if you have a hierarchical texture. So this is the microscale posts and then covered with the nanoscale texture to see if that's going to make the crystal crater effect happen. But once again, you have this flattening of the structure and you have no formation of the critter. And so I think what's happening here is that if you have this microscale texture, you enable formation of the crystals to occur on these little microscale pillars. Um, and once the salt starts to grow at that point, it's going to fundamentally change that contact angle, which then further promotes fluid growing into those textures. And so I took one of these deposits from this last image here I scraped it off to look at what's happening. And indeed, you see that these salt structures have formed inside of the microscale texture, except they haven't formed inside of the nanoscale texture. So that's telling us that it's really the nanotexture that's preventing the impingement of the uh, crystals that then forces the evaporation to move in a certain direction rather than being able to move horizontally along the texture. So next we want to know the effect of temperature. And so what we've seen is that leg growth increases at higher temperatures. And so here I'm breaking up the uh, crystal critter effect into two distinct phases. The first is the liftoff phase defined as the position or the point at which the drop is deposited to the point at which it starts to form legs. And then a growth phase, which is characterized by growth of the legs. And so the first thing to notice is that, first of all, the total evaporation time 
decreases as you increase substrate temperature, which is expected, evaporation is occurring faster. But you also have this change in ratio between the growth phase and the liftoff phase, meaning that at higher temperatures, the drop is spending more time in the growth phase. A consequence of that is that at the higher temperatures, where this red line here is the hottest temperature and down here um, is the lowest temperature, you have more time spent in that growth phase, meaning that the uh, legs grow longer and they grow faster at higher temperatures. And so we can model this using actually a pretty simple model. We start with a mass balance for the fluid where the volume loss of fluid is a function of the evaporation rates, this JO here, and the geometry, where N is the number of legs. You then look at a mass balance for crystals, where now we're looking at if we have a tube of fluid, uh, a tube of crystal, and we're modeling the outer radius of that crystalline tube, the inner radius of that crystalline tube, and then multiplied by N, the number of the legs, uh, and this is a function of dHdt, we can combine these two models by replacing this bvdt um, to find a model for this hdHdt, the height with time. Um, and we can solve that. And it turns out that this model here for this particular set of parameters with an RO of 15 microns and R inner of 12.5 microns, um, it actually matches experimental data almost exactly. So a very simple model allows us to predict how high and how fast these legs are going to grow. And so because the higher temperature leads to a faster leg growth, we can actually use this and apply a temperature gradient to the surface to induce rolling in a certain direction. So the legs are growing faster over here on the higher temperature side. And we have this drop that kind of rolls over multiple times uh, before the water is eventually completely depleted. And so obviously this is a very interesting and fun effect, but it also could have applications in terms of self clean materials and any application where you want to use spray cooling on a very hot surface um, and then maybe use a water that has some contamination, some salt in it, rather than a very pure source. And then you get complete ejection of the salt contamination um, leading to a self-cleaning surface. And so with that, I would like to thank all of my collaborators and mentors, uh, Kripa Varanasi, whose work, whose lab this work was done in, um, and also of course, all of my financial support. And I'd also like to thank all of you for listening and of course the organizers uh, it was very fun sharing my work with you, and I'm excited to hear any questions. Wow. Uh, well, thank you so much, Samantha. Uh, you are welcome, of course, as audience to react. I will certainly do so myself. Uh, I am uh, going to open the floor uh, to any question. Um, and as the questions are coming in, I'm going to start with the very first one. Uh, so. Samantha, the, it's an incredibly you know, uh, uh, straightforward work to appreciate, and yet it has the uh, depth of science in nanoscale that would be unexpected. And I think that's what makes it uh, just the whole discovery extremely exciting. And I love the way you concluded it with a self-cleaning surface being that uh, one obvious application, but I'm sure there are many, many others to imagine. You mentioned, uh, uh, you gave us two different perspectives. In the first part, you showed us how to form little uh, nano droplets that are periodic, hexagonal, close packed, um, even. Um, uh, and in the second one, you've shown us a crystal growth. And in the process, you did a couple of things. One, you changed the actual salt uh, from calcium sulfate to sodium chloride, I believe, in the second version. Uh, you haven't indicated to us what is the concentration of the salt, or at least I, didn't, don't, I might not remember. Yeah. What, what is the effect of the concentration of the salt on the uh, actual formation of either the patterns you see first or indeed the cell cleaning opportunities? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, so for both salts, all the salts I've done here, and the concentration was always at the solubility level. So for calcium sulfate, that's a sparingly soluble salt. Um, and then for sodium chloride, it's obviously highly soluble. So the concentration of that is, you know, 10 times over the ocean concentration. And so the concentration of the salt does play a role 
but the crystals don't start to form until you've hit a super saturation concentration anyway, which is why I'm starting already at that saturated solubility concentration. And so for the self-cleaning surfaces, I've actually done experiments using ocean water concentration because one, you could argue that you might want to just use ocean water uh, rather than a purified water source to do some of these spray cooling heat exchange applications. And so in that case, it's kind of what you would expect. The drop evaporates, it evaporates, the water or the salt gets more and more concentrated as it evaporates until you hit that solubility concentration at which point the crystals start to form, and you still get this crystal critter effect, this lifting of the legs, except it's going to be smaller because there's a smaller amount of crystal mass in there to begin with. Wow. <laughs> it, it, does, it does seem to suggest there might be a variety of uh, uh, naturally occurring phenomena that might indeed take root in this uh, 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 observation. Um, I have a question from uh, Matthias. Uh, regarding part one of your talk, uh, what is the nature of the nucleation sites for the triangle formation? Uh, did you explore means to control their density? Yes, so that's a great question. Um, and yes, we did think about how to control it. The problem is, is that it's the mechanism. I believe it's this kind of thin film instability called a spinodal instability. Um, and the nature of any instability is predicting exactly when and where they occur is very difficult. So it's very stochastic in nature. Like I can predict that these experimental conditions will lead to formation of a triangular pattern, but I can't tell you where all of those nucleation points will be. And of course, since we have such a hydrophilic surface that we're working with, it's a very smooth, uh, pure silicon surface. Um, any type of trying to add little dots is one thing we considered, like little indentations to try and nucleate the instability. Um, it's just, it's very difficult and it completely alters that contact line recession. So actually picking where those triangles are going to nucleate is pretty challenging. <laughs> um, from Dennis Grimard, the question, um, could you use this knowledge to remove water stains from surfaces from hard water stained surfaces uh, by using pure water? Yeah, so that's actually kind of where we started this work. We were interested in anti-fouling applications and studying evaporation of drops um, containing some type of contamination is a way of telling you something about how the crystals interact with the surface, which then tells you something about how to prevent them from happening. Um, and so, you could, I, I would argue that the works I presented here today maybe not be the most useful for trying to prevent these hard water stains, but I do have some other papers that address that issue um, more, more closely, where we're actually looking at how the texture of superhydrophobic surfaces um, and what you have on those superhydrophobic surfaces can prevent formation of crystals at those materials. A question from uh, Ya Jing Zhao. Uh, in your model for the growth of the critters, how mm -hmm. do you get uh, R0 and R? Uh, did you predict them or measure them by experiment? Uh, yeah, I guess the values, he says, uh, change with time, right? So for the, the, the radius of the inner and the outer, um, so those are experimentally measured, but they're measured from the stains left behind using those SEM imaging. They're not measured based on the critter legs itself because you can see during the growth, like they start big and then they taper off. But what's actually happening is that if you were to just, if you were able to really zoom in at that surface, you would see that the entire thing is tapered and that there's only this small little radius that's in contact between the crystal and the substrate. And so we experimentally measured them using the SEM images, the stains left behind, um, and did some statistics on what radius. Uh, was most occurring. Um, but you're right that if we were to pick maybe the high end or the low end of those uh, parameters, that the growth, um, the model I have on this slide here, uh, this model, so the dependence stays the same, but it would either move this direction or it would move up a little bit. Um, so yeah, we picked in this case uh, the most common occurring or one of the most common occurring radius.
that helps. <laughs> I have another question from uh, Ramiz Iqbal. Um, in the part, first part uh, that uh, describes fingering and stability, uh, can you explain why the crystals don't come closer in aggregate? Normally for microparticles, one might see close tacking of particles after complete evaporation. Yeah, that's a great question. So in the colloidal case, you have this kind of liquid bridge, which brings them together. But for this crystal formation and the fingering instability, the crystals are actually forming due to the evaporation. They're not already present in the fluid. And this is something that I've taken a lot of different measurements for, like uh, looking at what's happening actually from below the substrate using a clear glass substrate to ensure that the crystals aren't forming before the retraction. They're forming after the drops pinch off already. Um, so you don't have the same kind of liquid bridging effect bringing them together uh, because by the time that they're forming, the interface is already gone. Yeah. Um, th there are a couple of more questions, but allow me given the time to just ask the last one, which is uh, in your first part uh, where you've shown us the uh, patterning, have you looked into the uh, pattern surfaces and how would the pattern depend uh, dependent on the pattern surfaces? For example, having nanoscale grooves on your silicon substrate, would that have generated a set of beads in it, kind of like peas in a pod or, uh, yeah. <laughs> or other kinds of uh, a little bit more ordered or call it directed patterns so that you can superimpose your hexagonal patterning on predetermined arrangements on the substrate? Yeah, so I actually haven't done that, but uh, previous work has done that where they evaporate a similar case with like a salt solution evaporating on this surface that's already been chemically patterned to have hydrophobic and hydrophilic microscale regions. And so in that case, you do end up getting the crystals forming in the hydrophilic regions, um, or you could probably do the same thing using texture. So have textured versus smooth, where the crystals will be more likely to pin in the textured area versus the smooth area. And so I didn't do that here because in this case, it's just a purely instability driven phenomena. And so we could consider ways of controlling it, but if you maybe want to use this as a masking application um, and doing that, adding that complexity of kind of pre-patterning and then patterning almost defeats the point of having this extremely simple, look, we can evaporate a drop, now I have a mask. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, on that note, uh, and I do know there are more questions, uh, I will have to stop given the time. Samantha, thank you so much uh, for giving us a fantastic seminar. Uh, really appreciate your time and really appreciate your insights. If you have additional questions for Samantha, I'm sure she would be delighted to answer them via email. So please do not hesitate to send her or me or MIT Nano an email and we'll make sure we forward them so we can put you in touch. Uh, again, thank you so much for attending today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next week. We have a couple of talks uh, on Tuesday and on Thursday next week at 11 o'clock. Uh, the one on Tuesday is on the external field effects on defects in functional oxides. Uh, and the talk on Thursday will be on the record efficient perovskite solar technologies. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you next week.